Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Casual Climbers, the podcast by and for beginning hikers and those who may not quite be physically ready to tackle the Appalachian Trail. I'm your host, Donna Patrick, and alongside me is my husband and adventure buddy, Roy. Hey, Donna. Hi, Roy. So in this podcast, we provide you with information, tips, and tricks on how to get into hiking in the Blue Ridge area. We will cover some of the hundreds of trails in the various parks in the region and hopefully entertain you along the way. We're two middle-aged, perhaps not in the best shape hikers. Definitely not in the best shape hikers. Who love the outdoors and want to share our experiences with you. And this week's episode, Donna, is a special one. We interviewed Sean Llewellyn, park ranger at Paris Mountain State Park. Yes. Sean is one of the architects of many of the trails at the park, as well as other parks in the area, like Jones Gap and Devil's Fork, Table Rock. So he is an expert on park trail design here in upstate South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. I loved uh, speaking with him. He's, he's a great guy, and the information he gave was really neat. He gave us a lot of inside tips about uh, Paris Mountain too, which I found really interesting. Yeah, he's a wealth of information. I really enjoyed that. I was thinking about that interview with him. I mean, this is days later, but that was that was really a good interview. I I'm going to I'm going to reference it. Yeah, I think I will too. He gave some really neat insider information, particularly on Sulphur Springs, so listeners be on the lookout for a special feature that even we didn't know about. Yeah, inside tips and tricks. All right, let's get into it. Here is Sean Llewellyn, Park Ranger, Paris Mountain State Park. So hello, Casual Climbers. We're here today uh, with a special video podcast with Sean Llewellyn, uh, Park Ranger at Paris Mountain State Park. Hey, Sean. How are you guys? So Doing well. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Sean. How long have you worked at the park? So I started at uh, Paris Mountain in 2005. Um, I was hired under a uh, recreational trails program grant because um, we were at that time we were uh, expanding the trail system at Paris Mountain. Um, so basically I was hired under the grant and I worked as the trail crew boss for about two years here from 2005 till seven. Um, so when the grant ran out, I um, left here and worked at Jones Gap and Caesar's Head for about two years. And then actually the ranger position that I wanted at Paris Mountain opened back up and I got that job and I've been back here ever since. So I think in September, I'll have been with the park service for about 19 years. Wow. That's nice. But I most of it's been here at Paris Mountain. So I know, I know the, the, park, the park well, especially thanks to being on the trail crew, because when you're going out and scouting trails, you, you, you see every little piece of you know property that that you can right so is that how you got your start in park ranger service there at paris mountain yeah um I, my wife actually uh she showed me the job posting and uh um so i just put in for it and I have, i've always liked being outdoors going climbing and hiking um ride my bike. Um, so the job was like a perfect fit for me. So. I bet. I bet. I'm, I'm actually kind of jealous. It's a, young, it's a young man's job as well. <laughs> I can imagine. I, you know, I work in IT for my day job and so I'm stuck behind a computer all day. So yeah, yeah, I can, I can imagine just being out there would be great. Yeah. Just hauling tools out all day and uh, hiking all you know almost eight hours a day. It, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll wear on you, but it was good. I, I enjoyed it. What are some of your favorite aspects of the job? Um, right now, and even back then, it's kind of the diversity of the job. Um, because you can have a plan going into the day, thinking you're going to do something else, but then 10 other things occur and you're kind of all over the place. And that suits me very well. I, I'm not, uh, I don't like routine um, things. I like I like the diversity of it. And that's, that's the biggest thing for me. And also um, the ability to learn how to do all these different things. Um, so it's not just like doing paperwork at a desk, you you know, you're fixing electrical issues, you're cleaning a bathroom, you're just, just about anything. You go on clearing trees off trails or something like that. So yeah, you're a uh, jack of all it, trades. 
Yeah, you never know. You kind of have to be if you want to be a park ranger in South Carolina State Park System. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so how are the trails created? How are they designed? Um, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, it may be different for you know park to park or state to state. Um, nowadays, uh, there's a lot of sustainability involved with trails. Um, cause if you've ever, you guys know how Sulphur Springs is and Brissy Ridge, um, those were kind of just built with no sustainability in mind. And nowadays, basically you start with a, a flag line and you lay it out and it's, depending on if it's a mountain bike or a hiking trail, there's, there's a lot of different things that go into that. Um, but basically you're, the big, the biggest job is to get the water off the trail as quickly as you can. Yeah. Um, so what we used to do is actually go out when we we're laying out the pin flags and kind of getting the trail designed, we'd go out with a tool called a clinometer. And basically what that does is it'll measure the grade, um, from where I'm standing to the next person. Cause you don't want to break 10, 12%, um, grade on a trail. Um, cause that's where it starts to kind of get unsustainable and water's just kind of eroding the trail. And you also don't want to, you know, if you have like a section that's 12% grade, you don't want to run that too long before you uh, have a grade reversal in there where you can shed water. But basically, yeah, that's, that, that's kind of how we've always done it. We've, we've kind of conceptualized an idea with pin flags and then we changed it. And another big thing I was taught um, from a professional trail builder was to uh, always keep trail features in mind. Um, so you could lay out a trail and it could be not too exciting, but as you're out there laying out the pin flags, you might see a big rock or a humongous tree or just something kind of neat, like a rhododendron thicket where you can create a tunnel. Um, and that's something to keep in mind as well, um, is having those neat little trail, trail fe features out there, because um, it makes the trail more exciting in my mind. Uh, yeah we love it when the um what is it the mountain laurels when they're in bloom yeah. oh, oh yeah goodness. yeah you and and then there's and then when the flowers start to fall you you can go through and you, it's just like a raining white mountain laurels <laughs> it's just yeah a, it almost looks like it's snowing out there so. yeah mm -hmm. yeah there's a section Wait. of the sulfur ridge that's just past the mountain lake going up where it's following the the stream and there's tons of falls and cascades for a good yeah. good mile it is it's the toughest trail there at least Absolutely. The trail but i agree by far my favorite by far my favorite i love that section yeah I, th I think uh you know keeping that sustainability thing in mind um i do some most times prefer older trails where that wasn't really thought of um that are a little bit harder to maintain in a sense but uh yeah, I do. I do. That That's my favorite trail in the park is Sulphur Springs. We just finished that one this past weekend because um, we had we had hiked several sections of it in various port parts, but we never did the full thing, especially coming down from the from the top. And yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. I, I absolutely love that trail. Yeah. And there's one um, neat feature that not too many folks know about. Um, and I don't mind telling anyone, but, uh, so as you're going up the hike only, you're going past mountain Lake, um, the streams on your left, it's going to be on your right again for a little while. And then the last time the stream is on your left. And as you get close to the top and you're seeing the stream less and less, there's a little kind of path that goes into towards the stream, which there's multiple ones of as you're, as you're going up. But um, there's this big, strange rock hole. It's about, uh, I'd say like five feet around, four feet around. And uh, I don't know how it was created by erosion or something, but it's it's like a little cold plunge thing, but it comes up to about my, uh, my chest. And you, if you can't see it unless you're looking really closely at it. Wow. But so if you go up there in the summertime and you're getting kind of hot, it's one of my favorite things to do is to just, you know, pull in there, jump in, and you can only sit in there for about 10, 15 minutes at most before you start shivering. But uh, yeah, that's just a, a neat little tip for anyone that goes and hikes on Sulphur Springs. 
That's pretty great. So that's right before it gets up to the Fire Tower Trail intersection, right? Uh, yeah, a little bit before that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there is paths to it. So tr try not to bushwhack or anything. Just, you know, stick with the, the trails and the little, because little, on trails you'll have, if you're near water, there's always a path down where either someone's fishing or, you know, there might be a neat little waterfall thing. And that's kind of, that's kind of how it is out there. Yeah. Do you have do you have problems with people bushwhacking and making their own paths through and trails and stuff like that? Um no no, it's not too bad. There are I mean, I think there was a lot of things here before I even started. Um but since that time, I haven't really noticed a huge increase in people creating their own trails and stuff like that out in the park. So That's good. Yeah. In our travels yeah. we we rarely see people get off the trails, honestly. Most of them stay on. Well, we're yeah, all that, I mean, that's that, that's the best practice, um, yeah. you know, as far as leave no trace goes. So that brings me another uh, up to the, the next question. How do you guys maintain your trails? So um, a lot of it's actually done by volunteer groups. Upstate Sorba's um, a really good one. Um, they're at Southern Off-Road Mountain Biking Association. Um, and then I also have um, just people that come out to the park, the regulars. I have a um, young man I know, his name's Josh. He, he lives on South Buckhorn Road. And if I have like a tree down or something like that, I can literally just give him a call and it'll be gone in a few days. Um, but getting back to Sorba, um, the neat thing is they, they actually teach classes on trail building and um, doing trail maintenance as far as like going out to a troubled area where um, you have a lot of mud and stuff where either mountain bikers or hikers created a wet spot on the trail. And what people generally do is go to the right or the left of that. So then that causes what's called trail creep. Um, it kind of pushes the trail and expands it beyond that three foot wide zone that you're supposed to kind of stay in. Um, and they'll do things like create nicks and try to um, just get the water off so people stay on the trail. Because if you don't address those issues and you just let them continue on, the, typically they get worse and worse. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it's uh, upstate Sorba and just people who are good stewards of the park. And then also um, the staff will, will, will get out there from time to time. And especially when trees are down or something like that, especially like hazardous trees, um, that need to come down. How do you, how do you guys determine trail difficulty on, on the Paris mountain state park website, you have the trails and then you have the difficulty. How do you guys determine those? So I think there's kind of like three components to that, um, that I've always kind of, um, used. And one is that one of the big ones to me is elevation gain and loss. Um, because, you know, if you're hiking a one mile trail and there's a, you know, thousand feet of elevation gain, that's going to be extremely difficult. And then the next one to me would be the, uh, the type of terrain that you're hiking on. So like if you had a old trail like Sulphur Springs that wasn't built on sustainability, might be roots and rocks and steps and, you know, all rock scrambling, who knows. And then third, I would say would be like length. It, it could be an easy trail, but it might be 18 miles. You might want to take that into consideration because that's, that's not going to be the easiest day out okay. on the trail. So those are kind of the three things I would kind of base it on. Okay. So I, I noticed too, I guess Brissy Ridge is one of the older ones as well. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot. Uh, of park, well, yeah, the the hike only on both Sulphur Springs and Brissy Ridge are like the old trail. I mean, they were here long before I was here, um, but we did do some um, rerouting on Sulphur Springs on the opposing side of the hike only side to make it more sustainable, especially since you have both users out there. You have mountain bikers and hikers. And then uh, Brissy Ridge, it, we kind of at changed the that was before i got here but they changed the hike the shared side at one point which needs to be addressed again because you guys probably know how rocky it is on the shared side yeah yeah and even on the non-shared side there was uh 
last time we went a couple weeks ago, a couple of fallen trees that were pretty branchy right in the way we had to crawl up and under. But, you know, I, I don't ever mind those because it's kind of a an extra little wrinkle in the in the trail. Well, yeah, and it also makes it like honestly more more adventurous in a sense, you know. So. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So what are some things that you wish that all hikers and mountain bikers knew before going on a hike or or mountain biking at the park? Well, the first thing, if you're combining those two uh, groups into one area, I would just say etiquette more than anything. Uh, knowing when to yield, knowing when to like kind of step to the side and let the mountain biker pass. And then also for mountain bikers coming at each other, knowing when who who who's supposed to yield at that point so yeah any of the downhill coming coming into the uh uphill mountain bikers they should yield because they're building up so much speed but yeah just knowing that trail etiquette would be a big benefit and then the other aspect of it we were talking about earlier you know when you have a muddy section of trail or something like that Leave No Trace says you're supposed to just actually walk through that mud and not go to the right or left, which actually helps us, especially when we're maintaining trails as well. And that goes for mountain bikers as well. You just kind of stay on the trail. Um, so actually that, go through the mud. Yeah, actually right through it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't seem like it's the right thing to do, but it's the best thing because you, you don't create that trail creep where you're you know, potentially killing uh, plants or just widening the, the trail base, you know. Yeah, that's good to know. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that kind of, that speaks to the whole, how can hikers help make the park and trails better staying in the middle of the trail, um, even if it's muddy. That's one thing that they can do. Is there, are there other, I mean, of course, leave no trace. Yeah, that and just, uh, uh, being prepared for your hike that you're actually going to do. A lot of people just, there's so many factors. So it might be 90 degrees out and three people have like a 12 ounce water bottle to share. No. And you just need to rely on those factors. You never know if there's going to be um, heavy winds that day, a thunderstorm. So you kind of want to like plan your day according to what the weather is going to be what supplies you'll need, just various things. You have the right footwear. There, there's a lot of little things you could do to uh, prepare for that. But the big one for me is knowing what trails you're going to take and kind of being confident after looking at the map and knowing exactly where you're going without getting lost, knowing the, the, the blazes on the trees, the colors that match your hike. So Sulphur Springs is white. You know, you sh should be on white and you see that little two by six rectangle on the trees for those who don't know who blazes are. Yeah. It's just the little two by six uh, paint marker on the tree that you see every so often. And they change color throughout the park, depending on what trail you're on. But, yeah. We do try and let people know when we do a hike, what color to be looking for, for whatever hikes. And some, some of the hikes that we've done have been combinations. So, you know, we'll turn off of. Percy the... Ridge onto Pipsissawa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we use kind of a, a pretty basic system as far as trailblazing goes. Um, it gets a lot more kind of technical when you get into like a wilderness area because they'll have like double um, rectangles and that may mean something like there's a turn coming up or an intersection. So it's, it's kind of neat to, even though you're just hiking, there's a lot of different things you can kind of educate yourself on. And that way you kind of have a, you have more confidence when you're out there, especially if you're hiking at like Jones Gap or Caesar's Head or up in Pisgah. There's so much, so much to choose around here. So, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, yeah. Caesar's Head is our next park to hit. Uh, that's that's next on our. Do you have any recommendations for us for starting out there? Yeah, I always like to. Uh, my my favorite park that I've been to in South Carolina is Jones Gap. Um, I enjoyed working there. But I also like how the park is situated. It's in the valley, and the Middle Saluda River runs right through there. And the hiking up, even just the Jones Gap Trail to Jones Gap Falls is real pretty. And that's going to be on, like, the 
somewhat easier scale, even though the terrain is pretty rough on the Jones Gap Trail, it's real rocky. And then uh, my favorite waterfall out there would be um, Rainbow Falls. But that one, you're, you know, you're looking at a lot of elevation gain and stuff like that. And I believe it's about five miles round trip. Um, but I'll try to go up to that one at least like once or twice a year. We did and that. Then, and it, what's that? We did that one already. Um, uh, okay, good. Did you it like it? It us out. Yeah. I, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> did, did you guys do it when it was uh, during normal rainy conditions or did you go when it was dry? It was dry. We did it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, you'll have to go back up when it, when we get a lot of rain because it it sometimes comes down to like a trickle when when uh, when it's really dry out. It wasn't too bad. The rain, I mean, the rainbow that the waterfall itself was amazing. Uh, yeah. So, okay. He's just getting uh, there. The hike up was <laughs> yeah a little rough for us. Yeah. We, I actually got to help build sections of that trail and that little log bridge that you go across. Then we put the uh, fiberglass bridge in as well. Um, out there that was a, a full day of carrying uh, fiberglass back and forth you oh know, just wow that location so. last time we were there uh, we got pictures of this there was a, a little green snake inside one of the tubes on the fiberglass bridge walking over and he was just just sitting there in in the tube hanging out all day he was there when we went in and he was there when we came back uh, that's out. awesome yeah that's neat but yeah to get back get back to your one question uh if you want to go up towards caesar's head i recommend doing the dismal loop and okay. basically that'll kind of take you down to like matthews creek and you'll cross that and then you'll end up at the what they call the cathedral it's a big uh rock wall it's just beautiful the whole hike but again that's one that's probably quite a bit harder than um rainbow falls because i think it's about eight miles if i remember correctly um round trip what so talking about the snake what what are some of the wildlife that you can see at paris mountain so one i always like point out to people um that come and want to just like hike around lake placid they just want to get their feet wet at the park and go for a short hike i always point out all the beaver chews around the trees because there's probably a hundred of them or so uh but as soon as you start around lake placid um at like the corner where the amphitheater and mountain creek meet as you're walking around that whole side you'll see where you know it almost looks like a pencil sticking out of the ground because the beavers are constantly you know knocking the trees down and damming damming the creek up actually that we always have to maintain but yeah that one's one one that sticks out the most um when i when people first visit here there's black bears which we seem to have resident black bears in the past seven or eight years, I'd say. When I started here, I, I never saw one. I, I don't think I've ever had a hiker report one, but we're seeing them more and more in the park. And I don't know if that has to do with all the building that's kind of going around Greenville. So that's kind of neat. Uh, the, and I don't think anyone's had any issues there. So just uh, keep your distance and, you know, just look at them. Yeah. <laughs> what is the... Uh recommendation if they do it we've never encountered a bear in in any of our trails we've seen lots of deer but no bears what's what's the recommendation if someone does come across one uh just to be calm and just slowly kind of walk away from it give it its distance that would be my best piece of advice i have seen a few bears in the park and i had a guy running after it with his camera and i you know had like you can't do that don't you know so we've had just be smart about it you know, it's a pretty strong animal, so. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, I don't yeah. think I'd be running after one. There is that old, that old adage about, you know, make a lot of noise and make yourself big. Is there any merit to that? Yeah, I think so. But I think that's if the bear's like approaching you, uh, you'd want to seem big and hold your pack up and make a lot of noise. I That might be an unlikely scenario, but you never know. But yeah, that. That's one thing I didn't think of was just, you know, making a lot of noise and present yourself much bigger than you are. So. Right. Last time we walked on uh, Mountain Creek, we saw two pretty good sized deer in in that area that you cross. I guess there's a power line running through this one area. So there's a wide gap between the, the woods. Yeah. They were just there grazing and they, they were they were pretty big. 
Yeah, there, there's more and more deer in the park. I had to live down at Camp Buckhorn for about six months while my house was getting renovated. And uh, every night we'd look out. I actually lived kind of in the lodge. And every night we'd look out the window um, after the sun went down. And you'd see about anywhere from 16 to 18 deer in the uh-huh. field down there. I don't know if they were grazing on clover or something like that, but they were out there just about every night, and uh, it was a pretty neat sight to see. Now, Camp Buckhorn is open to the public. You have to rent it, right? Yeah, so it's uh, it's a group camp. So basically, you have to rent the the lodge and all 10 cabins that come with it, and basically, it's a two-night minimum as well, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's that if you... If, people haven't been to the park before you get to the very top of the park there's a gate right there mm-hmm. if you were to rent camp buckhorn you would have access through that gate and then it's about another i'd say mile or so all the way down to camp buckhorn it's almost like you're traversing the mountain in a sense you're going up to the top and then going back down the other side we That's very did, cool. we did the north lake trail one time well we took you know canuga uh, to to north lake and we saw the sign at North Lake that said that that's a fairly recent acquisition by Paris Mountain. That property was owned by the Department of Water, yeah. Greenville County Department. Greenville of Water. Water, yep. Yeah. Can, what can yeah, you so about that? I believe we, I'm trying to think what year we acquired that. Uh, I'm just guessing off the top of my head. I think it was like 2003 or four when I was hired under that RTP grant. That's how we decided to utilize that property was to actually connect Pip Sisawa down to the North Lake. Um, Canuga came like a year after that. The cool thing about that property is we do have a, a ranger house out there that's down at the North Lake. So that gave us another housing opportunity. And it also works well that we have eyes down there because there is some holding tanks and stuff like that down there, you know, that someone's living down there. But uh, yeah, I think in 2003 or four, we acquired that and Greenville Water gave it to the park service at that point. Do you guys permit swimming in North Lake? Uh, No, then the main reason for that is the only area that we recommend swimming in is uh, Lake Placid because DHEC requires that we test the water to make sure it's safe to swim in. Um, So we pull our permit every year and uh, test from i think it's like april all the way into october and then after that we'll shut the swimming area down for the year because no one wants to swim out there usually in january but uh yeah i mean if i i I don't recommend doing that i i'm i usually tell people if they want to go other locations go like five and six and get in the creek or something like that because it's not like you're you're kind of like wading through it you're not really swimming but uh, yeah, that w- Lake Placid's the only location where we allow swimming. What piece of advice would you give beginning or brand new hikers? One piece of advice I always give to folks that are coming in to look at the map, I always explain to them the, uh, the topo lines on the map and then also the direction of the trail they're interested in taking. So that gives them kind of like an idea of where the tough sections are and where the easier sections are. So when they're looking at the map, if you know the, the, the topo lines are 40 foot intervals of elevation, I, I believe that's what's on our map. I point out to those areas where the trail is just going perpendicular to those. And I can explain to them, yeah, you see that? That's gonna be a hard section on the trail. So they can kind of take that information and use it just about at any other park that has a map. So if they're not sure if, you know, if they can handle the, the terrain or whatever, they can look at that and say, okay, so that's going to be about, you know, 200 feet of elevation gain in a short little section. That's one of my favorite things to teach people that have never hiked before. And we actually have a lot of folks that it's their first time hiking out here. And those are some little things I like to teach them that and about trailblazing and big thing is also staying on the trail, not, not trying to deviate or just bushwhack through the, through the woods. Uh, Cause we do have an endangered species of plant out here. And that's something that we, uh, when we're building new trail, we have to uh, 
uh, survey for because that tells us whether or not we can actually put the trail there. And there's a lot of other reasons, but uh, yeah, I think just some of those basic things when you're looking at a map or deciding what trail to take. I like to give them little key things that they can use as tools for hiking in the future. What is the, uh, what's the endangered plant there? It's a dwarf wild ginger. I do not know the scientific name of it. Mm. That's okay. We're, I may be wrong, but when we did the Sulphur Springs Trail, uh, actually, no, it was, it was, I think it was Brissy Ridge. I could swear that I saw yucca plants. You did. Okay. Yeah. Did I? Okay. Yeah. 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 I didn't think. Yeah. I remember. Plants. Yeah. I remember seeing those when uh, I first started and I took a picture of it and showed it to the park interpreter. And I asked her about that. She's like, yeah, that's what it is. I was like, I thought so. I didn't realize it grew here. So yeah, neither did I. That's why I was like, yeah. I, I can't be right. This isn't. Yeah, I mean, it looks it looks dead on. You know, it looks the same as you know any other yucca plant. But I was surprised. I I had no idea. So. That's crazy. Yeah. Which trail is your favorite? Your personal favorite? At. Um. It. So mine changes through the season. So my favorite trail, seventy five percent of the time, is uh, Sulphur Springs. On the hike only side, I'll literally kind of hike up to the top and just do a, uh, I'll turn around. It's like an out and back as opposed to doing the whole loop. But I would say October ish into November, I really enjoy going down to the North Lake. And then, you know, I'll take my wife down there and we'll have a picnic or something right on the dam because you're seeing the, you know, the whole profile of the mountain and you're in front of an, the biggest reservoir in the park. Um, and just looking at all the, uh, the color change on the leaves and stuff like that, it's just, you know, I, that's the one time a year that I prefer that over Silver Springs. Yeah. <laughs> do you yeah. take uh, Brissy Ridge to, to Pipsissawa to get there, or do you go the other way? I usually go uh, Brissy, Pip, Pipsissawa down to the North Lake. Um, sometimes I'll, I even recommend to folks that don't quite want to do five miles, um, if they want to shorten that hike. I highly recommend they take Brissy Ridge to Pipsissawa and then take a ride on the North Lake and just go out to the dam because that's like the big payoff for me out there. Instead of, you know, if they have the energy, go ahead and do the whole North Lake loop. But if you're kind of tired and, you know, you just want to get back, go check out the dam and then turn around and come back the same way because that almost shortens it down to four miles as opposed to five miles by adding the whole North Lake loop in it as well. I recommend doing the whole thing. But yeah. yeah. Oh, we loved it. We loved every second of it. Th those five campsites there, do, do people have to pay for those or do they just register for them? Yeah. So basically you, you'll kind of do both. I remember we were building the North Lake loop and I forget one of us had the idea to add campsites out there. And we, we took the idea to the, who were then the Rangers um, and they were all for it. So I think originally we may have had six, but the sixth one wasn't really uh, in a good spot. But uh, basically what you have to do is uh, there's a little bit more rules to those campsites as opposed to the uh, our regular, uh, what I call car camping or RV um, sites. You'll have to call the office. You can make a reservation or you can just show up the same day. Um, provided there's a site available. But then you also have to register your vehicle with us. So we need your tag number, make model, and you have to do all that before the office closes at five. And the reason for that is if you were to just like drive up to the park and you rented a site and didn't tell us that vehicle belonged to you, we actually have to stay and run the tags and make sure it's not someone who's lost or hurt on the trail. So it's really important that like at the end of the night, we know every car that's here overnight, who it belongs to. Um, yeah. And if we don't, then that makes us a little worried till we figure out who it is. I but usually, that, that would yeah, really you, suck if they didn't tell you. So you guys had to that, that, every trip. That happens. Yeah, yeah, that happens from time to time. But usually uh, a lot of times when you run the tag, you'll kind of see that the reservation matches that same person's name. Mm -hmm. And I'll just call them just to check. But then there's some cases where you just, you know, you don't know. That's yeah. So they, so they have like cell phone signal out there. 
Yeah, I mean, we had it I think in the past like 10 years, I don't know that I've found a spot anymore that doesn't have cell phone reception with the exception of like uh, Sulphur Springs and five and six. It, you still have reception there, but it's really spotty. But yeah, the, just about everywhere in Ferris Mountain, you do have cell phone reception, which is kind of nice, um, especially for, you know, doing a search and rescue in the park. It just makes things a lot easier. I can literally get to a location where someone's hurt and send a pin to like the fire department. So they know exactly, you know, how to get in and where to go. That's and awesome. Like. Does that happen frequently? How often does that happen that there's search and rescue? Or- um, I don't know that there's any like uh, regularity to it kind of happens at random, but it will happen a bit more often, especially when that temperature gets up into the low 90s and up. That That's when it starts to kind of spike a little bit. And that can I've seen it happen to people who are just trying to get in shape and go out there to like folks that, you know, run 30 miles a week or something like that. So yeah, it's just, it's kind of it's random, but uh, it does it have mostly people. mostly to do with um like people not uh, hydrating enough, not bringing out enough water, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's that's a big part of it. But I also think that uh, you know when it's ninety eight degrees out and you're running in the middle of the day, I don't know. I think even if you're the most in shape person, the heat might eventually get to you, especially if you're doing like a 10 mile run or something like that. So, yeah. and I, I don't fault people for doing that. I mean, you know, you got to get out there and live your life. So, but you also just need to be careful and hydrate and stop when you're getting overheated. That's I'm really, really glad that you've been there for them, for, <laughs> for them and possibly me in the future, but I'm going to try not to make that me. Yeah. Don't make that <laughs> yeah and I, I always tell all of our, like assistant rangers that are kind of starting out at the park one of the first things they really need to do is uh really know the lay of the land and the trails because when that kind of thing happens it might just be them with the fire department or someone and they're relying on them to get the get them out to the location that people are at so as someone who lives on a park it i always say it's good to know your park very much. Even off the trails, you never know where someone may be. So. Yeah. yeah. So my mom told me some exciting news that Paris Mountain State Park is trying to, or in the process of acquiring 140 acres of new land. And yeah, gonna... so we we just had a public meeting the other Tuesday, night right? for for that. Yeah. So basically, what we're trying to do now is get another RTP grant. So we can have money to build trails out there. I think it's about four miles worth of trails. And we do have a map. I can actually send it to you guys um, that has like a conceptualized trail layout for the two different trails. Mike Watkins, our trail coordinator, he's working on kind of like tweaking the trails so they're so everyone's happy. And also um, in some of the areas, the terrain's kind of a little steep. So we're going to tweak those as we go. But uh, yeah, as, as as of now, we should be, uh, it's going to be like a three-year process from the time we, we get the property, hopefully the grants, and then actually have trails out there. So that is exciting. That's, that's, you know, you don't often see the parks growing in size. That's, that's such a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially like with Paris Mountain being its proximity to downtown Greenville and all the neighborhoods that kind of surround the park, it seems like every so often we're getting it like Sassafras Trail. Um, we acquired that, I'd say six or seven years ago, but it's just shocking to, to keep growing like this when we're, when we're so close to everything. So, but hopefully we'll continue to grow. I hope so too. Where is this new land uh, located? So it's going to kind of run if you were in the park and you're driving up the mountain. um, And if you're looking over towards Mountain Lake, it's going to kind of run up through. uh, Like if you're ever looking off at Mountain Lake, you see the really steep train going up on the other side of the reservoir. It's going to run up through there and then kind of up near Fire Tower, near the Stone Ridge community. And that's one of the areas that's kind of sensitive because we want to, I don't like to see houses while I'm out on the trail. I want to feel like I'm out in the woods and they also don't want to have hikers ending up in their backyard, which I I understand. 
so we're working on tweaking those lines and trying to bring the uh, trail system farther down so you don't see that while you're out there but basically it'll run from almost sassafras trail i think they're going to try to connect it into sassafras and then all the way up towards uh the end of fire tower there that's super exciting that is very exciting i so the fire tower trail, it, it wasn't on the, the questions that I sent you, but that was such uh when I, when we first went up there, it was such a treat to see the ruins of this 1930s building right there. And, you know, the plaque gave a lot of great information. It, it was a, per we stayed, we stopped there and sat on the edge and had our lunch. It was great. Yeah. That's just, uh, it, it's neat to know that you know, you're walking through someone's house in a sense, you know, being inside the foundation and thinking about what they were doing and having a fire in that fireplace and stuff like that. So Yeah, it was pretty great. But as you said, that is the, there are two spots, I think, on the trails that we've taken there where you can see a residential house. And that's yeah. one of them. And the other one, I think, is on the, uh, the uh, Mountain Creek Trail. Mountain, Mountain Creek, yep. Yeah, there's, there's. And a, that's relatively, uh new prior to that house being built i think there was like a small pond up there and you really couldn't see anything but i don't know if the landowner or the new landowner decided to build a house up there but uh yeah that that's something you just don't want to see when you're out hiking but again paris mountain so narrow as you're coming from like uh lake placid all the way up to uh sulfur springs i mean there, there's not a whole lot. You, you don't have a lot of room to kind of get away from that in a sense. No, and there's only two. I mean, it, yeah. it, you have to go really out of your way to get to one of them. And the other, yeah. the other one is not, it's not right on the edge. I mean, it's probably what, 300 yards away from the trail? Yeah, uh, I'd say about that. Yeah. But yeah, in the future, I think we're going to try to, any new trails, we're going to try to stay away from any of that. Just there's a, you know, the experience there, you know. Yeah. So what what is it that you want people to know about Paris Mountain State Park uh, that they wouldn't normally ask or know? Wouldn't actually ask or know. Um, um, that's a good question. Um, trying to think. In our last uh, episode, well, I guess I guess in our last episode, I don't know if you listened. It's OK if you didn't. We covered the naming. Of oh, uh, Richard how Paris. It's named and how yeah. uh, Richard Paris was perhaps not the most reputable, respectable of gentlemen. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. If you get to reading on him, it's a it's yeah. li little, little rough. But uh, I think my uh, probably favorite thing to explain to people is this is kind of where the first drinking water for the city of Greenville came from. That's why we have all the reservoirs throughout throughout the park so in a sense um, Paris Mountain kind of gave birth to downtown Greenville so that's that's a big one and then uh, you know I kind of just like talking to folks and telling them you know old war stories out here and rescues and things like that and one actually came up the other day at the meeting a gentleman brought it up he uh, he was he started to tell a story about how these kids came to his house and said one of their friends was stuck in the chimney on fire tower trail. And oh, no. so I got the call. <laughs> I got the call. I was sitting down at the office. I thought it was a prank call because I, I didn't think someone would try to go in the chimney, but, uh, we got up there and yeah, there was a kid, I guess he was trying to, his friends were trying to bet and see if he oh. could be like Santa Claus and go in the top out the bottom. He didn't make it. Um, <laughs> But anyway, it was we had to get the department up there. What's that? How old was this kid? Um, I think he was like sixteen or something. Oh, yeah. old enough to know better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was funny. We had to get the fire department out there and extract him back up out of the the fireplace. So I think he was in there for like two plus hours. So. Oh God! I don't, I don't think I'll try it again. No. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I have, I'm curious about something you mentioned, you know, you thought it was a prank and that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm actually curious if anybody, I don't think that you would have ever 
spotted one, but have you ever had anybody say that they've spotted a Bigfoot in Paris Mountain State Park? Is there any kind of lore about that? I haven't at the park, but one of, I think his name was Al Addington. He was actually um, on the central maintenance crew. Prior to that, he was a ranger, I believe, over at Devil's Fork. Uh-huh. And I remember him telling me a story how he had to do an incident report and it involved someone seeing Bigfoot. I don't remember the details to the incident report, but uh, okay. yeah, he he was one of the uh, one of the guys that got to write a report and Bigfoot was in the report. That's, but, that's amazing. I just I had it, to ask. I'm sorry. My, my, um... <laughs> no, that's a that's a good question because that, <laughs> uh, that, that's how I've heard that's happened. So. <laughs> Just wanted to know if he if he happened to be spotted in Paris Mountain. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I haven't seen Bigfoot yet. So. I keep okay. an eye out for him every single time. I'm just gonna let you know that. <laughs> yeah, I'm always keeping an eye out. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, thanks so much. Sean Llewellyn, Park Ranger, at Paris Mountain State Park. Thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate it. It was a blast having you on. Yes, thank you. Donna, that was such a good interview with Sean. I was really happy that he was able to come on and talk to us. Yeah, I was too. So that's our show this week, guys. Uh, we had a long discussion with Sean Llewellyn, park ranger at Paris Mountain State Park. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did talking to him. And next week, we're going to get back to the trails. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be looking for Bigfoot, I think, right? I think so too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's out there. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe to us in whatever podcast app you use and be sure to leave us a review. That's how our show grows. Feel free to check out our trail photos at casualclimbers.podbean.com. If you have a question, comment, or just want to drop us a line, you can reach us at casualclimberspodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you on the trails. It may be Bigfoot. Yeah, we'll see Bigfoot on the... We might be hiking with Bigfoot. I hope so. Yeah. Have a good week, everyone. <laughs>